Hello everyone, today we talk about the Battle of Burg Terhuld, fought on March the 26th, 1124, between the forces of King Henry I of England, and however led by Otto Borlang, as the sovereign was in Cannes, if I'm not wrong at the time, and the rebel Norman forces led by uh, Valeran de Beaumont, or uh, actually Omari III de Montfort, that were both there, this depends on the sources, today we will follow um, Arderic uh, Vitalis, that uh, is, is the most informed one, uh, but all later. Um, this battle is interesting for, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, this is a, a tactical history video, like the ones made on, on battles, usually. They do not happen frequently, because they often take kind of a bit more of research. In this case, um, you know, we have a few sources, actually, and it it, for the development of the battle, definitely Orderic Vitalis is the uh, the fundamental one, if not properly the, the only one, tactically speaking. We will refer to, to others as far as minimal details, including the employment of uh, horse archers in battle, but we don't know exactly how, right, uh, is, is concerned. By the way, here I inserted a picture of the uh, battle map, which is the same one you find on Wikipedia. Normally I make my own, but this one exemplifies well enough what we think happened. P.S. At the end of this recording I modified it a little. Uh, in the Creative Commons credits in the end you can find the um, link to the original map, so it's fine. But we'll continue with one that is in fact already modified and it's what I think is the right one. Right, even though this is just um, a uh, bit of a theory more than just uh, a mere hypothesis, uh, meaning what that, uh, as we will say now, and again, I don't know much about the author, how he, he drew it, or whatever. We don't have to take this uh, literally. Even the same location here in the forest of Breton is, we know that it was fought uh, there, etc., but we don't know much about the terrain, so most of what you actually see it's a matter of uh, speculation, I agree. However, there is a theory here that I perfectly understand, even like, not knowing it explicitly, the author's intentions. And it does stem essentially from a uh, diachronic and comparative uh, study of you know, medieval tactics specifically. And the engagement per se, I will explain this naturally, the engagement per se is not of huge significance. It was actually a small one. Consider that the um, royalist forces counted 300 milites, as Orderic says from, from the sources. So these were essentially mounted men-at-arms that dismounted this battle as it would happen also in others here that there, the Bramul had just been fought uh, five years before, very close to this place. Burtaul is in the forest of Breton are just next to the Seine, right? So this is a very, um, in this uh, location, very Norman kind of engagement, right? You have properly here, as you can read also in the Legion, uh, essentially an Anglo-Norman force against a, in fact, rebel, properly Norman one meant the, the Western Frankish uh, Normans that, however, are not to be distinguished because at this point they are still literally the same, right? Um, England had been conquered just um, uh, two generations before, because Henry was the fourth-born son of William the Conqueror, and this war, we will, uh, in the battle um, tactics videos, we do not actually um, digress too much on the political strategic background. Th this war basically is part of the um, Henry I's uh, campaigns in, in Normandy, that um, had been necessary uh, in as much um, his brother, Robert Courthouse, that was actually the eldest son of William the Conqueror and Duke of Norman in this sense. And as you know, William had split his English and Norman domains at his death, uh, the usual kind of Frankish, um, in fact, uh, rule, right? Uh, uh, in theory, you know, preventing feuds for you know, splitting kind of more or less equal or at least proportional inheritance among the sons, but actually uh, an important cause of fragmentation. It, it, it was not just 
per se, right? The mechanism that would bring to that fragmentation. I just started um, a series about um, it's the, technically the historical regional one, but about England following probably the, the the history of the monarchs. And I covered this period, so you can look um, in the medieval English playlist at that specific fa case. I um, at this specific context, let's say, I created also an Anglo norm playlist, a Norman playlist. So I, I, I am expanding that gradually. We said something about the Normans just a few uh, days ago. Um, in any case, um, as you know, the, there had been an, a war between uh, the true brothers and essentially Henry, that was very, you know, effective ruler, managed to uh, defeat his brother. Um, essentially, the, the opposite faction was exiled. This was exploited by the King Louis VI that I made also a video on months ago, just essentially from a military point of view, looking at the beginning of compaction of the Capetian monarchy in a more concrete political and territorial reality, originally wise. And Rupert Courthouse's son, William Clito, was essentially sponsored by Louis VI to uh, reinvade invade Normandy, and there were always... Um, troubles as some Norman uh, barons were, were rebel to Henry and this is essentially the typical typical really um, uh, Norman say between 11 and 12th century uh, Norman warfare um, in that um, south of chivalric feudal uh, reality that of course as we'll see also now is much more uh, you know shaded in many ways but still for reasons that are not uh, uh, hypocritical. I mean, the hypocrisy is just Howard's that um, not to understand exactly what this word was about. Um, but, uh, in, and especially, um, one of significant uh, warfare, of course, but through some patterns that were, in fact, evolving um, towards an increased use of mounted warfare and so on, but when, in the, the first half of the 12th century, infantry did play still an important role. All over still what you can see here as post um, Carolingian Europe, right? So properly Western warfare broadly meant. We have significant examples in France, in England now that it was conquered by, by the Normans. Uh, that at this point were essentially Western Franks. We see it in Germany, we see it in Italy, and we have to cover a lot of this. Because um, the Battle Book to Ruled has been fought still in a context where you have at this point essentially an English, at least looking at the um, geographical provenance in this specific campaign, and most of them were, they were French. And again, it doesn't make any sense to distinguish that because these were normal so it was all pretty damn homogeneous right but it's still politically and strategically the idea fundamentally of a of an english intervention in france that is very similar in many ways even to some contexts that we've seen in the hundred years war why do i say this um i know it does sound anachronistic and i'm the first that, as you will understand from this video, doesn't actually think that this is specifically a, a national, that there, there is specifically any national pattern here, right? It has to do with different shades of this specific Western warfare, and we will try to explain why in this context it took especially certain measures, certain degrees. But that, in fact, can help us understanding also, and as I try to do, especially in the video I made in autumn, about the Battle of Poitiers in 1356, how much of the mythology that essentially there is a specific tactics that that belongs to just a certain, in this case, either a people or a nation or some kind of, you know, doctrine. Right, that it's really anachronistic as a concept for, for the Middle Ages specifically, um, is is a wrong approach to the, uh, not just for the, the anachronism in itself, but also for understanding the actual effectiveness of these tactics, right? What here the royalist uh, troops enact is probably was a little masterpiece, given, again, that the engagement was... Uh, fairly contained, right? We're talking prob probably uh, 
about less than um, or significantly less than 1,000 knights from, from both sides, right? Um, it, but aside from the political outcome that was important to reinforce Henry the first uh, rule uh, both in Normandy and in England, which is a thing we have dealt with elsewhere, it also exemplifies, in fact, pretty well what a pretty universally effective um, understanding of the use of force, of reserve, of synergy, of the arms um, can a accomplish on a battlefield. On the other hand, this is also a um, uh, a battle that we will read mostly from Orderic Vitalis, and again, the details in the other sources are very scanty. This is not a considered that Orderic is a very famous figure in himself. As you know, he was an English chronicler and Benedictine monk. He was born in 1075. And interestingly enough, his father was a um, a Western uh, Frankish priest, right, who had entered the service of Roger de Montgomery, the, the first Earl of Shrewsbury. Thus, within this context, his father was, was French, um, and his mother was Anglo-Saxon. Uh, still, in any era, he would die in 1142, um, so in which, as you know, lots of things happen, especially uh, where, uh, where Orderic uh, lived uh, in, the, in the Midlands, in the on, on, the, uh, on the border with, with Wales, right? So an area that would give significant problems to the more kind of southern, you know, Saxon-based, uh, uh, at that point, Anglo-Norman monarchy. And we have seen, again, you know, with the baronial struggle really uh, ongoing forever on these axes. So it's a, he's a very interesting, he was a bright writer, um, as we'll see now just fr from his prose. However, we have also to to appreciate uh, these, this work in his uh, historical context, right? So, uh, the the way he writes is pretty pretty balanced, right? But he also adds naturally some information that we have to read, um, not just carefully as always, but let's say realizing was partly influenced by literary models, not probably not so much to affect uh, the the ridicity of what he was talking about. It was from Henry's side, fundamentally. Uh, and this um, and this battle is uh, aimed to, of course, uh, to, to, to show some, as, a, as a royalist victory also some kind of... Um, I, I say royalist by way meant, uh, as far as Henry I of England was concerned, this was like more a different thing because from a Norman perspective there was still the idea of a, of a, of a Frankish royalty. There, but of course, Orderic doesn't tell us all what happened, right? This picture here again of the battlefield that I interspersed with images from, say, mostly, in fact, uh, Western Frank and partly England for, from that time, um, is reconstructed again mostly on what we could think. Uh, may have existed beyond what the sources tell us, right? Because sources, like especially these um, clerical ones, monastic ones, are uh, are aware of the war of their times, but they don't n didn't necessarily write to explain to us e exactly the mechanic of a battle. But maybe the guy knew that, right? Maybe or maybe he I don't know wasn't particularly interested in it um, for telling exactly, or leaving a sketch or whatever. It was just not done at the time. So we have to make an important effort to compare this battle with others, or at least to, to be aware of the development of the art of war in the high middle ages, to realize what, you know, in, in which context we can interpret it, and trying to fill the gaps that uh, here are, are left open. So for today, I actually decided to read just um, the entire chapter um, uh, 29 from the uh, the twelfth book of Ordericus Orderic Vitalis, translated from Latin, of course, um, to um, to illustrate right certain say aspects of this battles. Know, a description that I think are really helpful as far as the 
the information is concerned. Because there are some specific military details that are definitely not random. This is something, uh, as you know, that I always struggle uh, f uh, for when uh, making the job that I do, because I reconstruct battles uh, for a living, practically. And that is to say, of course, giving rendering back the, 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 the credit that Chronicles actually deserve um, as just not necessarily for the technicality per se that is also you know interestingly pointed out but for the just the role that these authors had in their own community right they weren't writing just to entertain someone they weren't writing just to say uh, write well or express in topoi they wrote for imminently political, social, cultural, moral reasons, right, that are not just, okay, this person was writing for political reasons, so it's propaganda, or there is, you know, some shady, uh, you know, reason behind I mean, politics is everywhere, right, you know, uh, the, it's not, uh, the, you know, writing for political reasons does not make you uh, unreliable, or, you know, a liar, or, or actually doesn't even mean anything in terms of how objective or unobjective you are, right? So I'm very surprised by, of course, a branch of still Western historiography that considers, say, scholarship more important than sources, which is frankly ridiculous. This battle is easy to reconstruct because literally uh, Orderic is also practically the only source we have in, uh, regarding this the, the level of tactical information, which is, of course, again, to obviously a warning for us they be aware that if we just read another account of the same uh, of the same complexity we would think different things about this battle there is no doubt about that still what is written does follow a pattern that we can easily recognize and on the basis of which we can reconstruct this battle um, also in a way that makes sense for again the, the broader pattern of the art of war in, in these times and we'll explain exactly how because that reference to the hundred years war was not anecdotal there is a specific link here and we could uh, and we will expand on it. Um, uh, I don't remember where I have to make any other premise however we can simply uh, read so uh, basically, there's a bit of strategic and kind of uh, background here. The Norman rebels began to plunder certain areas around, and so there are these castellans of Henry I that um, set forth to meet with these rebels and intercept them, uh, in fact, to the, at the forest of Breton near Bourg de Roule, uh, and the battle is, is fought there. And the the picture, as we will see now, is that at least according to the source, um, the the ro uh, the loyalists, let's say the loyalists, um, just per se, instead of royalists, are um, uh, are few, but good, right? Three hundred milites today. Again, we don't read the Latin text, but it's also very easy to read. Frankly, you could do it on your own if you're interested. Um, and then the enemy was allegedly uh, much larger in number, right? And banally speaking, we will see it now. We know from the loyalist side just 300 knights. Let's call them knights by approximation here. And we're not told, say, there were 300 knights, but maybe there were also, I don't know, some other troops, right? Actually, there is a hint from it in the text we'll read now. Um, but that's all what Orderic wanted to to tell us, because he was brought up in a, you know, in a, in a reality that, of course, mostly looked at, essentially, this is a feudal history. It looked like the knights, they don't even care so much about the, the militias, the peasantry, whoever was there as well. As we'll see now, there are archers as well, that the, we're not told whether they were the same knights, as it did happen sometimes, or not. We will digress partly on this issue as well. Um, so, um strategically the idea is that the eventually the, the rebels give battle to to this smaller force and tactically this influences the array that the latter use which is dramatically similar again to the english tactics of the hundred years war 
that as I advocated uh, for 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 a long time, and as you've seen in the video about the Battle of Poitiers, is one of the most beautiful battles, actually ever, uh, in in my experience to to have uh, reconstructed. Uh, and that really shows you there the the level of um, you know of uh, of leadership and uh, tactical skill and kind of broader moral. Uh, accomplishment of the black brains and so on and that has barely anything to do actually with um, a tactic that would be specifically different in that case for example f between the the English and, and the French and or you know actually a very scanny and also controversial and actually pro armor kind of um, uh, uh, let's say uh, information about the use of archery and if you reconstruct the battle you realize of course that there had the English had a longbow or, or crossbow that reached no uh, they, they did have crossbows as we've seen from the same source but um, it's not in the scale in the bigger scale of things of what happened on that battlefield from any evidence a of course not not just a determinant factor but concretely not seemingly even a relevant one or an important one at least. Um, so I will not start digressing on that uh, specific issue of how much we have thought essentially that the English had doctrinally something different that allowed them to win. It's just that they they won because in that case they were better, right? And also the kind of tactics that, the, yes, they, they use in a different way in those specific battles were obviously induced by bigger um, uh, uh, issues such as the fact again that they were often outnumbered and they were in defense and that changes the way you uh, you defend yourself tactically right so uh, the French likely would have done the same thing had they been in the, in the same English situation but since what eventually most of the thing gets down is moral forces um, not necessarily they would have won in the same way or maybe they would have even scored a bigger success or maybe the same we don't know right the point is that that alleged um kind of doctrinal you know discovery for which uh instead the other side was just uh, essentially a bunch of imbeciles that charged straight this kind of sort of corner of that is not a historically factual uh Reality. I mean, this thing, first of all, never happened, as it is clear from the same battles. Secondly, um, it's it actually entails a much more kind of uh, harder, right? It's not that it was particularly complex as a mm, tactical plan, because right? also uh, there are a few things after all you can do on a battlefield, and just even for doing those few things, it takes a lot of strength, right? Um, and that. Um, was always uh, dramatically balanced in odds, right? So you cannot, of course, look at the Hundred Years' War not noticing that there is a pattern there that makes, in condition of symmetry, given that France and, and, and England were materially, in terms of material culture, they were homogeneous, where right? there was no difference practically, the ob objectively, by uh, numbers, right? The strongest harmony, the, the English army of the, third, of the Hundred Years' War the strongest army in history, right? And uh, on the base of that kind of numerical criteria, this doesn't mean that England, they lost the war, so this is, uh, in general, the, the point that it's not even, of course, the tactics is what some of the least relevant issues in war just per se, but that's how you also win wars sometimes thanks to, among other, many other things, except those many other things Nobody really cares because they're very complex and um, people mostly treat war like, you know, a football match, right? From from the sofa, from, you know, in incredibly cheap and um, simplistic and willingly uh, ignorant um, sources that do not tell you really what, how things really work and how they work. Um, so let's read chapter 29 of the 12th book of Orderic Vitalis Ecclesiastical History. So the siege of uh, Vatterville on the Seine 
the battle that here is uh, known as uh, Rouge Montier. And I was talking about the Battle of Book Tahul because the name can vary depending on what kind of names you pick from the place. Um, then there is, it, we don't read the entire chapter, it's the, the, that um, part about the, the king's cruelty to his prisoners and particularly to Luc de la Barre, the minstrel, and how Beaumont surrendered and so on. This is another issue. Consider also that not just Orderic was living in a in a Anglo-Norman reality, but that this entailed he traveled substantially across the Channel. He visited Cluny, Cambrai. He 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 went around. He knew pretty well things going on uh, in southern Italy uh, during the First Crusade. Um, so of course he was uh, the. His entourage was uh, the one in which the Normans more or less maintain a sort of broader connection with each other, and from also the various lands they had uh, conquered and so on. So they, um, this is part of the broader Norman epopee, right? And specifically in this case, from what is already, as we'll see now, explicitly perceived as an Anglo-Norman um, perspective, because at some point the Norman rebels call the loyalists um, Angli in Latin, right? So it's pretty eloquent here that already a, probably a divide in understanding what had been established even by the same Normans of Normandy in uh, uh, in England was fin- significantly different from what happened in, in Normandy, at least from the perspective of ordering. Because we don't know, of course, here now. You see there are a, a bunch of characters, what they actually said or how, right? This is obviously inserted in the uh, in the text sometimes, uh, like in, f- in the form of direct speech, for spicing up the prose. But it's still significant that for, again, a, a person from the background of Orderic, it was important to show what these uh, knights said on the battlefield, what kind of... A spirit animated them, kind of ideas they had, and, and so on. Right, so we are again in 1124. It says in the Lent following, Count Valoran, this, these are the rebel, the Norman rebels against Harry the First. Um, they carry out this raid. Right, uh, they they attack a citadel. They, they start plundering other places. We'll see now. Count Valoran, Valoran de Beaumont, hmm, assembled his allies. Here again, I'm also. You know, of course, reading an English translation, the the Latin text is you know semantically more, it's different. Just you know, but I I checked especially about military technicalities. There isn't, it's a good translation. Says, so, so he, Valeran assembles his allies, and on the night of the Annunciation, went to Vatteville, where they fortified the tower. He had with him, uh, he, him three brothers in law, Hugh de Neuchâtel, son of Gervas, uh, Hugh de Montfort, and uh, Guillaume uh, Lovell, the son of Asselin Guel. But Count Omori took the lead of them all. Right? This is uh, Omori de Montfort, who uh, arrived, and basically, even though it was Walter who had, you know, started. The, the campaign, you know, is, is chosen as the leader. This, this tells you how feudally composite these forces were, but they were also pretty homogeneous. As you know, what we're talking about here essentially was um, sort of knightly elite of some sort, so uh, heavily armored uh, troops with, you know, coat of mail, um, uh, kind of shaped shield, a lance, uh, a secondary weapon, like, I don't know, an axe, a sword, um, even even side weapons like aside from daggers, whatever they could have, or crossbows were there, or bows. Because again, there are other sources who just briefly mention of this fact of horse archery. Uh, in this case, specifically from from the, from the loyalist side. Uh, but uh, if they had those in, in their ranks, surely the enemy, there was also more numerous, had that. So it was used, right? I will not digress here more than much about this the spread of crossbow that was al- always there. I mean, even the Picts in, in the Dark Ages had crossbows, right? You know, at this point, they're just being revived. And from the terminology also, sometimes they don't understand where we're talking about bows, such as long bows, that is 
literally only bows larger than the average, and they were in in Western Europe historically done since pre- made in prehistory in the same identical way ever and used in every single country in the same way. Um, and crossbows that were increasing mostly for, and given you know the, there is always um, a cause effect. Uh, relation that you can also it's always double thread in the same way armor was becoming heavier and also cavalry was growing so having uh, a missile weapon that could take down as we will see now uh horses were largely unarmored as opposed to their riders was was an important thing then there were the the majority of these forces was composed by foot troops of some sort soldiers militias uh, also just more the years and they were of, uh, of different level of armoredness. Like even cavalry, of course, exists in the lighter uh, uh, form, right? With less armor and more agile. And it was more numerous than the ultra elite one, but this was the, the size of force. Um, all these other forces, including the missile ones um, on foot and on horseback, assisted the heavier elements and especially this ultra elite that was the spearhead of the formation naturally the nobility made that made that up so these men as we'll see now were just warriors by by temper right i i should stress that even though objectively what we're talking about in terms of normans is literally just a pure identical and complete um copy uh, because they were just the same uh, they didn't even need to copy that of, of what any other Western Frankish force, there is, and this is a bit where the debate sparks with this battle, some kind of character associated with Normandy and with essentially Anglo-Danish, and by this time, as it was conquered, Anglo-Norman England, that would still maintain a degree of um, foot troops higher than in the, let's say, than on, on the continent in, in a on average, but especially in the in the say in the center, for example, of Capetian power, or in the northeast of France, where properly cavalry had been engineered in that professional way, in in large numbers since uh, say Merovingian and Carolingian times, it's probably a stereotype. I will digress on that at the end of the battle, but there is no doubt that at this point uh, it was pretty common before the the mid 12th century still to find knights dismounting also in pitched open field battles uh, on a regular basis for for many reasons that here especially in terms of terrain we can't quite uh, picture because we know practically nothing of that but as we've seen it could happen even in the 14th century so knights were trained to fight in every single situation with any kind of weapon with any kind of formation with any kind of tactic Right, they were just optimized for that kind of enhanced, kind of now thickly packed uh, shock charge that the Normans were also kind of more famous for, except they were practically, again, like all any other, at least technically, as uh, any other uh, Western knight, except people say they were also less kind of secular in mindset, they were descending from kind of this Viking background, so they were kind of more spirited and more aggressive. De- definitely there was a level of of brutality and kind of aggression and ambition here that, of course, made the same Norman epopee. They, it was that, it was moral uh, superiority, was the sense of just knowing that they were the winners here. Like, that's the same thing animating, as we'll see now, the entire here... Uh, the entire house of Normandy, as far as these branches were still fighting each other, but also the the prestige, of course, that had been conferred to uh, to the to, to the Norman kings of of England now for having conquered uh, this country all in one shot. Right, so um, we are seeing we're again they're incredibly brutal and primitive and archaic times for for our even stereotypical standard of the Middle Ages, um, but also very advanced in many other ways, including the tactical one we will see now. Uh, and we can perhaps go as far as saying that there was some... There there may have been, at this time, still a kind of, kind of Anglo-Danish bias for foot troops that, as you know, were... Uh, 
prevalent. There is an infinite debate about Anglo-Saxon warfare, and uh, you know that, in my opinion, is also a bit too, you know, uh, say, I don't know, speculative by a degree, but probably things were more normal than, than we think and there was cavalry in, in Anglo-Saxon warfare consistently so not just um, in a as a secondary role in any case uh, that's another issue that I discussed in the Anglo-Saxon warfare videos and I I'm not to digress on it because it's another time okay the Normans have taken over so that's not uh, let's not uh, get sucked in that topic again because it's it's big, right? And it requires a better focus uh, in a time that now had disappeared. And, and this is also because from the other side, the counter argument, which I also actually stress, because I I do think that there wasn't necessarily a specific doctrinal difference based on national backgrounds. Um, not only you find this type of tactics elsewhere, right in Europe still dismounting the knights and fighting on foot and so on. But the, there is a trend here that has to, especially in the second half of, of the 12th century onwards, optimize towards the, the dominance. The knightly dominance, the mounted, right, the equestrian dominance on western battlefields uh, that is also achieved in England. Right at this time, after the Norman conquest, you you see that armies are essentially Norman in nature, right? They they are they have cavalry as the, the size of weapon, the same battle of Hastings shows that it's it's all about combined arms. Don't get me wrong, but you cannot argue aside perhaps from some kind of say backwardness in the equipment in areas like the Midlands, etc. You can argue that there was kind of a greater infantry force saying that the one existing in France, right? Or um, uh, in other places where cal that were, there is no particular sign of a greater infantry prevalence over, over cavalry. Cavalry here had the upper hand, definitely. Um, the, uh, the, it, it, before the mid-10th uh, mid century, uh, the 12th century, you cannot argue that it would be decisive per se, because a battle like this actually shows that infantry won over cavalry, and or at least, this is debatable because there is a reserve, we don't know exactly what happened, the reserve was mounted, right, so we will try to see this better now. But there is a, an important um, resistance of infantry that seems to have been decisive, uh, and that we have to, to appreciate uh, exactly in a context where cavalry was normally decisive right already from from centuries now on the continent uh, and that's why the pattern saying oh well maybe there was a kind of a British influence here from the loyalist side that brought to this infantry to be stronger for some reason I wouldn't go as far as that right I think that these were pretty again th there are Normans fighting against Normans here so um, we're not informed about uh, which troops were used um, uh, were, were, were they recruited? Right here we see they're mostly, again, Norman troops. They had surely been reinforced by um, uh, English ones, uh, uh, by, by the king. But even in that case, we didn't know exactly. Right? The, the fear was still there, was still working. There are, there, are, there are signs of, you know, important infantry capability, but we don't have here the... the quantitative dimension of how this was true for this battle in any way. Unfortunately so, right? Because it would be really fascinating to know. Under these leaders, the expedition introduced a convoy of provisions into the besieged place and assaulted very early in the morning when they were not expected the entrenchments which the king had thrown up to straighten the fortress. Right, so here essentially the loyalist troops were besieging a fortress um, still held by the, the rebels. Um, this force uh, comes to the aid of this fortress. They resupply it. They enter at night in it, and then they carry out a sortie, uh, storming the uh, fortifications that the besiegers had placed. That the loyalist besiegers had, uh, you know, put there to to harass this place. 
Uh, in this attack, while Walter, the son of William uh, de Valicarville, uh, Val who had been the king's appointment, um, the chief command of the troops on guard, was standing on the rampart of the fortification in his coat of mail, bravely defending the trenches. He was ingeniously caught by some one with an iron hook, and not being able to extricate himself, was dragged down and carried away prisoner. Right. This is an interesting note. It did happen. It would happen as, as far as, for example, the Battle of Bouvines, the, the King of France, uh, even almost a century after this, is hooked and pulled. We made a video about the Battle of Bouvines by, uh, say, between the, you know, by the enemies, right, they wanted to capture him, to kill him, and, you know, pulled from the other side by his uh, bodyguard, his, his defenders, right. So, this idea that uh, knights were also becoming really heavy, right, and of course armor was anatomic, ergonomic, and, and everything, but it, it, it was still really heavy, and it did hamper movement by a degree, because just the weight does it, right, so it, you're never as agile as, as if you didn't wear that. These men were, you know, also kind of athletically fit. They they knew perfectly how to dose their energies in, in armor, etc. But sometimes you, you could simply be hooked in different ways and be, you know, pulled away like that. In fact, this guy gets um, caught uh, like that. Um, the Count Balleran had given the custody of the tower to two brothers, in whom he placed great confidence, Herbert de Lusieux and Roger, with eight men at arms. Right, so you see here the dimension even properly. Uh, what do you say? Eight militas, right, defending a place, right? You, you could argue these are small engagements, yes, but even behind a single milas there, there was a significant cost, right? Um, they were talking about even relatively small areas here. Um, so the, the the effort for the local community would have been really high anyway, right? So Valoran then pillaged all the farms around the neighborhood, significantly enough, and carrying off all the corn and food from the houses and churches, conveyed it into the tower for provisioning the garrison. On the same day, the Count, savage and foaming like a wild boar, <laughs> uh, went to the forest of Breton, and finding peasants there, cutting wood, seized several of them and lamed them by chopping off their feet. Such was the way in which he desecrated the blessed feast of the Annunciation. Right, so not just a rebel, but also an unimpious one, according to Ordric, of course. But he did not escape with impunity. Right, so now we, we don't digress on what the reasons were behind this, we just wanted to make um, a scorched earth policy or if he um, just had some problems with his communities previously, just he wanted to, you know, he was the saddest, wanted to do this or wanted to significantly damage at least certain specific areas. Of course, these were all resources uh, stripped from the, uh, you know, the, the kings, at least from what would be the Duke of Normandy, as Henry claimed to be. All right. Uh, and um, meanwhile, R uh, Ralph of Bayeux, the castellan of Evreux, having received intelligence from his spies that large bodies of the enemy had entered Vatteville in the night, went with all haste to his friends, Henry, Odo, and William. These are uh, Henri de Pomeré, uh, Odo Be uh, Bourlaine, and uh, Guillaume de Harcourt, and informing them of the passage of the enemy, earnestly entreated him to oppose their return by defending the king's highway, well armed. Right, so the rebels have succeeded in you know, forcing uh, a loyalist blockade. They are uh, pillaging in the surrounded areas that the enemy is, is you know, wanting to, to retain control of. So these loyalist troops placed themselves on the on the road that uh, the rebels would have had to cross to, to come back, right, so right, essentially cutting their supply li uh, 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 lines and, you know, escape routes, uh, bottling them and awaiting for, for them at the return. Naturally, here we're not given extra details, but we 
we we assume that of course that was the only that it was known what uh, plan those rebels had to, to come back and through that road and that it was their uh, their their only way out. So this would force them into battle against these loyalist forces. Then readily acceding to his proposal with their principal liegemen, they collected, so these were the, the loyalists instead, 300 men at arms, militas in the Latin text, handsomely equipped near Burterhult. And debouching from the forests of Breton, waited for the enemy on the open plains. On the seventh of the calends of April, they would be March the twenty-sixth, as they were returning to Montfort, as the enemies were returning to Montfort. The royal troops, coming in sight of the rebels and observing their superiority in force and numbers, began to waver in the presence of such formidable bands. Right, so at least this could be a topos. What probably happened is that the numbers were fairly balanced for an engagement to, to Ensu, because otherwise they would have not stood their ground either. Right, so th we get this information that likely the rebels were um, superior in numbers and apparently also just stronger um, than, uh, in general than the loyalist um, troops that had were trying to to prevent their uh, their escape from the area um, so there is this sense of you know kind of the not despair necessarily but you know the, the loyalists are impressed by the enemy force and this makes them waver makes them discuss the uh, the convenience in, in taking that stand to crush right? so, upon which some of the leaders endeavored to encourage their troops right they these were the, the most experienced commanders they they understood of course what the morale of the men that see a, a much larger force approaching is because it's immediately like you know that this is a serious thing right the, here people are going to get killed um, and it may be you uh, quickly if you take that stand so the question is that there is a sound strategic opportunity here to s significantly weaken um, if not capture as will happen uh, these the, the the enemy the leaders uh, of the of the expedition that uh, disrupting their forces inflicting them a very heavy damage as well as much as it could happen for your side though other board length said uh, consider that moving these troops, um, gathering them there, as we've seen, just had a cost per se, right? So this was uh, happening in uh, across short distances, so it was not like a long campaign of some sort. But it still existed within the frame, as we've seen, of a broader war that had had significant weight. So it was a matter of getting it over with um, by scoring a significant uh, strategic success. So Otto Borlang said, quote, so this goes the, the speech, the king's enemies ravage his lands in security. In other words, we're not doing anything to stop them. And have captured and are carrying off one of his lords, the guy who had been captured in the blockade, successful bo blockade um, uh, forcing we've seen before, to whom he had entrusted the defense of the country. So that guy was a, you know, was a significant loss for the royalist cause. It was also an extra moral reason to act that would, um, you know, would make, in fact, those forces recovered in case of success. So uh, what are we to do? Are we to suffer f uh, them to lay waste the whole neighborhood with impunity? It will be best for part of us to dismount and engage on foot while the other part remain in saddle and fight on horseback. Now this is already interesting because eventually it seems like the battle is won just by a significant mounted reserve deployed um, 
evidently uh, in, in the rare, we're not told explicitly, or I don't remember now we're going on with that, but let's say this will have to wait what th this first line does and then evidently intervene. Right, so there is immediately kind of the, the, the plan laid out here. It's an in-depth uh, array which counts on the capacity of the first line to on foot to significantly wear out the uh, the enemy cavalry. If, if this fails, there is a mounted reserve as well that has to intervene. Um, this may be an indicator per se of the, of the numerical inferiority because you know uh, when an enemy uh, line is engaged against another, even if you know the the, the latter is weaker, right, is making this enemy line engage in combat, right? So. This may even be sacrificed in a sense, but the freshness of the reserve, sometimes even with astonishing numerical inferiority, is successful against the uh, uh, essentially a spent line, which of course is not like a magic trick. It depends on how truly uh, exerted this, this this line really is. So it, they may they might have resisted to. To further attack, but let's say if the the idea is simply breaking a very strong infantry formation, right? That consumes the cavalry substantially. And so, if you have a fresh cavalry unit there, that can simply charge straight at them after that combat. They they have a significant chance to, you know, to exploit successfully that um, uh, the the fatigue that has increased, and uh, just that that is very psychophysical. At once, right? It's not just about the um, the force per se. It's it's about the the context, the how this this uh, reserves like, basically interact and um, follow on you know uh, one after the other, right? And not only as we will see likely now. Then there is an interesting information too in the plan proposed by Aldo Borlang. It says the bowmen. The bowmen, right, should form the first line to annoy the enemy and check their advance by flights of arrows which may wound their horses, right? Um, by the way, I would like to point out that if you search for this battle on the internet, mostly you get to Wikipedia and uh, that uses also uh, the, um, the quotes of. A book of this kind of disclosure one level that um, suggests certain things that eventually just uh, are inserted in the in the text of Wikipedia that, is, that are not demonstrated, right? That I don't know because I don't have the books. They're not probably um, there isn't an extra. In fact, they're actually reported as things like probably it may be that, right? And so um, we have actually. These are the, the tactical information that we have. It's not, uh, there isn't much more, right? So this thing of the Sagittari, for example, are, is there. However, we don't know more than this. We don't know specifically whether these archers were stationed uh, like uh, as, as wings, right? We're not told explicitly here in the map. That I posted, they're represented like that, and I th I think that it does make sense in a way because um, you see that's lighter infantry, presumably. I don't think that the line was segmented and kind of uh, kind of uh, separated bodies, right? That would especially uh, be let's say astray from the the battle line per se, right? Uh, there is this this idea that the wings are to be simply uh, put in a sort of uh, you know kind of corner fashion, so inclined to to form a chamber of that. But is, that's something that the archers, especially as lighter troops, can do during the battle, uh, especially when the enemy is engaging the heavy that is the ones that they have to break. Uh, Archery is, uh, even assuming that, which I don't think is the case, would have been manned by, by heavier troops, as it did happen sometimes, but would 
like in this case, like in most others, like be composed by lighter troops. So they are lighter infantry. If you have, essentially, as we will see now, we, we don't even know what the enemy had, right? If they had archers as well or not, right? We are told just of cavalry, and here Odo is planning to take down the horses specifically. It says, in fact, as we've just um, read, that the bowmen should form the first line to annoy the enemy and check their advance by flights of arrows which may wound their horses. Now, this is the idea. We, we In the Latin text, we're told of, of an agmen that actually in classical Latin, I don't know whether in this sense Orderic was aware of that because you know that the, the battle line once deployed is known as Achius. The Agmen is technically what, at least in classical ra Latin, was used to describe in terms of um, units in marching for march formation. In this case, instead, we have properly the, the battle plan, the, the battle array. And obviously, when we read Agmen here, uh, we can't think of a battle line constituted by archers, per se. Right? So, simply... Uh, a line deployed orderly so that you know of, of light infantry of, of missile troops that are evenly useful because they can uh, wound uh, the horses um, and that would be immediately ch charged into by the heavies that at that point will simply run through them right this is the difference between heavy and light troops um, that's the difference it makes Right, and the lights are lights exactly because they cannot hold ground against the heavies, and that's how relatively the, the concept is. It's not how, just how heavy you are, but how much you can maintain uh, hold ground in that case. Right, so that there was an Ackman, a sort of another battle line of archers in advanced position is probably not correct. Here, probably what the author means is that the um, the archers were to um, slow down the enemy uh, advance by harassing the enemy in, in an advanced position. What that argument could be, but we're not sure about this either, is that the famous horse archers that are mentioned by, by other sources that do not give us otherwise any tactical detail and information about them um, may have, say, been used as screens, like in a kind of skirmish mode, coming back and forth, right? So actually wearing out, maybe even in an aggressive sense, the enemy before uh, this would fall on the infantry, right? So soften them up, disorder them, just to make eventually the heavy infantry resist better against that. This may be um, one, one issue. Uh, which is suggested perhaps also, however, this is the point, uh, here it says when the enemy is going to advance, these archers are going to harass right, the enemy cavalry and wounding their horses. So this makes it sound like it's not as it often happened, like even some places um, against, I don't know, against the nomads, etc., that there would be an entire battle line of of horse archers that would just carry out hit-and-run tactics, going back and forth, softening up an enemy line that at that point would have to stay still under the under the, the fire. Because um, any attack would simply see the enemy retreating because they were lighter and so on. This sounds as something different, right? I, I do believe that there were horse archers in this battle, for sure. I would bet on anything. Like, horse archers were there pretty much everywhere, in many other battlefields in Europe, in Western Europe well documented there were surely also javeliners I mean at this point the Normans still had a like other knights in Europe like that kind of thrown javelin legs proper against the enemy it was also pretty pretty heavy right especially you know you throw a short distance a javelin is generally speaking more effective than, a, than an arrow uh, against the enemy this sounds, however, literally that there was a sort of predisposed amount of archers in a not better specified advanced position that would have to slow down the enemy charge during the cavalry charge during their advance, right? So the or, or attack specifically. 
So this could simply mean, and this is what the map represents here, there could be archers in a kind of, uh, not necessarily uh, just advanced um, position, because we see here the, the term is in prima fronte in Latin, which means just on the first line, which doesn't specify that it was like a, a, in front of all the others. Right? This may simply be at the same level of the front line. Right, this is something I found also in other Latin um, in vernacular sources later on. You say, but the enemy, uh, the you know, you find in in the first line these forces. Yes, but th they may have been exactly in or in in a position that you consider advanced, because normally, for example, these troops would be not at the same uh, level of the in this case of the dismounted knights, or they actually would all likely always be present. Uh, especially on the wings again, and so this concept of advancement makes sense, right? The first head, let's say, the, of, of the formation may simply mean that the archers were to be on the same line with the knights. So I, I think that as an hypothesis, because we will never know what did actually happen on that battlefield, that the um, that the archers may have been again stationed uh, on, on the flanks. And the only reason, by the way, why I uh, inserted this battle map picture with the this Anglo-Norman archers, archer wings um, mounted or dismounted, because there is also that, that option, uh, on, let's say, not strictly aligned with the uh, with the all the Borlang here dismounted uh, knights um, battle line is that these probably did move as far as the enemy attack uh, on I his flanks right this was the purpose but but it was a dynamic tactic it, it didn't entail that wings had to be just um, more advanced as you find in here this is a very frequent mistake especially when you consider that the enemy may have used the same exact tactics as a matter of fact we were again we don't have evidence that this was the case um, here as we've seen it says that the enemy was uh, but only the, the knights would be presented practically um, so people reconstruct the battle and say okay that's the only thing we know so it was that right that's how we reconstruct battles well no not really because Arderic may not tell you that the enemy had the same kind of um, of deployment uh, he may have a pretty articulate one here again you see just these two boxes of rebel Norman cavalry um, and just doing this weird movement uh, here with, with the arrows that I, I I I leave, but just to to comment against, right? Because because per se doesn't mean necessarily anything, right? Um, and the point of this was rather when you know if the enemy had had some flank troops as well, of course, uh, having a struggle between the um, the wings themselves frontally. What you see on the map as well here of the reconstruction is that there was probably there was possibly a flanking attack. This is also speculative um, but it is true that um, such um, tactics could be used. Right? For example that guy that Wikipedia quotes in this uh, general book about uh, I don't know Norman warriors all these kind of things Actually, it's, you understand the battle is resuming just a couple of, of pages, so it doesn't, it's not a, you already know by default that there is no analysis there, just telling a story based on this information and not digging in the thing. Um, but he discredits this idea. He says, ah, but at this point um, they didn't use these tactics because we don't find evidence in, in, the other, in the other ones of the same period. Thus, no, it's unlikely that this was the case. It's unlikely that if they had, for example, horse archers... Uh, first of all, he says it's unlikely that that, uh, you know, something so simple like mounted archery that existed. We have 12th century evidence for that in different uh, 
areas of Western Europe that had nothing to do with the steppes or some kind of ethnic warfare. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, again, Central or, or Eastern Europe as nomadic influence or, I don't know, Southern Europe with some Saracen influence. No, we're talking about hardcore kind of Western, um, kind of Frankish, practically, uh, warfare, um, displaying, by the 12th century, notoriously mounted archers. Right, and uh, I I think I've never made a video about that, but it, it is, uh, they were there, and they were there, and for this early period we know, of course, with also by a substantial scale, exactly because they were documented, first of all, uh, and so they were an important part of these armies. And secondly, they um, just, um, you know, they're described as in consistent groups as well. Um, sometimes no source at the time tells us, ah, but in battle we use them like this. Nobody cared at the time to, to explain that to you. Because warfare was fought like that, and it had, in their view, probably always been fought like that. Mounted skirmishers, archers, uh, crossbowmen had arguably always been there. Right, so it was not a big news, right? It's just at this point, tactics were becoming a bit more complex because there were more available resources, more professionalism, more mercenaries. Thus, um, combined tactics were kind of refined, more, um, let's say, uh, more in general, and thus enacted, um, uh, consequently. Thus, we see them happening. Right, so this thing of horse archers again is, I, I can't say in this areas especially, is so frequently uh, documented. It is true, um, but it may be simply that places like, again, Normandy or England were slightly less documented than others. For example, uh, we, we know for sure, for example, you know, in, um, in, uh, in northern Italy there were uh, uh, mounted bowmen regularly employed by the communes and probably also crossbowmen specifically so um, these were the same places after all I mean, in southern Italy there were the Normans the Normans were in the Near East the Normans were as we've seen here across the channel so the question is they, they surely knew they were among some of the finest mercenaries and troops available around um, they mastered warfare uh, this, the, the technology was there the, the evidence is there why shouldn't they have used mounted archers or crossbow at this point? Um, there is no, uh, like, in all the ingredients are there. And it's not just like a technology that must be invented and applicated. We know the technology, of, of course, had always been there. And this sub it was used consistently to even have documented units that were employed regularly in the West like that. So the question is, uh, how can a person deny that? What kind of method this person... I don't even know who was the author of that book, but let's say usually who, those who make that kind of disclosure level books are not experts, are just some sort of amateurs that go as far as saying, but this is not true, maybe it's just, you know, a topos. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you, at this point in history, you just uh, go like that methodologically means that you properly don't know the deal. You're not able to look beyond it. what we also have practically a certain today is historiographically and the pretty sound evidence. The problem with this battle, if anything, is that this whole thing of the flanking a, a, a attack, the wings, etc., is not explicitly referred to by the sources. So this is an entirely different uh, historiographical problem because uh, this doesn't get, um, uh, you know, you can argue that it may have been the case that such tactics were actually uh, employed. The problem is that you don't have an explicit reference to it. Thus, um, it's not that you can simply compare it with other battles and claim that this was the case why it happened. Because as far as we know, with such a contained engagement, um, you know, we can't even properly say how orderly even these tactics could have been carried out or whether there was an, an opportunity to do that or a space to do that. 
what diachronically comparative history tells us is that quite likely any army at that time would have already been quite versed in flank attacks and the fact that these are normally not documented until you know in a consistent way in western warfare until actually in this century they start appearing right so in the third theme um, is the moment of greatest uh, exploit let's say um, and people said oh this is because of the crusades no it's bs right that's a universal tactics used by everyone that now we just s start seeing because uh it was better documented because there were more people that were writing about that and engagements were larger and so there was greater in interest in their tactics right and an individual like orderick here had no interest as i was saying before to descend in the tactical details of this battle the important as we will see now is that you know is the outcome of the battle it's who was captured what happened later that, that's a big deal because it's political how battles were fought at the time probably was you know a matter of everybody's knowledge to the point that nobody nobody really cares they, they, they attacked from the flank yes but we're talking about a clash also between 300 knights and I don't know how many enemy knights, maybe 500, we want to, to, to say, like, to put a fair ratio there, um, or even more, but it, it's still a contained fight, right? You, you, it's not such of a big deal of a clash that you would even need to, to say, oh my god, it was a flank attack, it was so difficult to carry out. What if just for such small engagements you can you know that the smaller the engagement the the greater the tide you can turn right so the smaller an engagement and the more kind of things like one guy defeated ten guys can happen right if you're talking about i don't know clashes between thousands of knights with you know tens of thousands of, of infantry well at that point you will have a major documentation for the same fact that were fought you had properly civilization could record them and would talk about them so there you would have the details about the tactics emerging from one source and another. Even at, in the peak of medieval history, um, I don't know, if maybe of 30 sources that talk about a battle, just 10 will offer significant tactical information, and maybe just two or three, if, if a flank attack was carried out, would refer of that. You just see that they don't care, that they have their own degree of kind of okay normally battles are fought like that what, what's the point you even point out if it wasn't even such a clamorous thing but we know uh, for example about you know maybe even the enemy the, the the rebels here had some reserve and concealed unit or whatever maybe the, the thing collapsed before they could, could enact the plan so we we will never know because that's all we know basically about that battle <laughs> and all the people who fought there were dead and they wouldn't leave us anything and it's highly unlikely that at this point we'll find another source that we had forgotten from the 12th century and or even from a later tradition would tell us tell us exactly what it tell us because they these sources normally do not do that they are in a completely different mental order than the one we are and they don't care and actually they tell us um, much more important things that we think it, it's us it's our fault for being obsessed with technologism and kind of rationalism that we think that what is written here is important only if it talks about technical stuff. It's not, right? Every then thing he says here is valuable as much as knowing that, you know, there were some specific tactics enhanced in, after all, such a relatively contained engagement that he thought evidently to have been a a big deal enough to, to describe it at length for in this sense political reasons maybe look at this rebels who were crushed this guy had been cutting people's feet on on the annunciation day you know what what, what a what a hog he was or literally he says that as you've seen before so um that's what the guy was interested in this guy was a benedictine monk right he knew enough well the Norman military ethos knew what this clash was meaning uh, in a spiritual sense because that's also what the knights actually cared about not maybe the way a monk would but still in the ways that we know militarily speaking as far as uh, that heroic take on on, um, on the individual 
uh, destiny that we have analyzed in, in various videos. So this is really important. However, you immediately understand from these details, as few as they are, that there is some kind of mental machination behind that, that there is um, the awareness of Orderic of the significance of this plan. He understands the concept that there was a reserve, he understands the concept that he wanted to absorb the enemy charge with these uh, archers deployed in a, in a frontal position. Um, these are the same tactical insights that we see, again, we've seen in the Battle of Poitiers. There is a larger force, you have fewer uh, troops, and you have to, to create a position that fundamentally uh, dilutes the enemy impetus, so you have to deploy in charge with several reserves, and you have to use everything you have to slow down the enemy um, attack, so that you can take out the enemy in detail in some way. And this is a pretty universal concept. They're also a monk at the time understood. So even hardly, you know, this is monks, uh, clerks didn't understand warfare because they were just monks and clerks. But speak for yourself. Like, well, what kind of person normally today understands these things? And at the time, a monk would be likely to know them, right? In in on on many occasions. Um. So going on with the speech of Otto Borlang that illustrates the loyalist battle plans as the um, this thing again I, re, let's reread it the bowmen should form the first line to annoy the enemy and check their advance by flights of arrows which may wound their horses all right there is debate on the rate of fire normally they would use volleys at a time because it's more effective uh, at parity of time and and uh, projectiles thrown if you concentrate them all in volleys they're more effective they disrupt more the enemy order even at parity of losses they increase entropy because they concentrate that kind of punch all at once right so the, it disorders the enemy formation better uh, then of course you can imagine these just because they were nervous or they weren't sufficiently trained or whatever they they th these troops would also at some point recur to kind of more individual shots especially i don't know if the enemy was particularly close they would try to aim at some you know part right while before you know with the volley was mostly concentrating fire so somewhere right and then the, it was important to be precise. The important was to be accurate, generally speaking. Gen precision, just a very short range in a situation that is not positive. Like if you have to shoot an enemy at, at short range as an archer, if the guy is, is, a, is a cavalryman, you personally are not in a comfortable position. Also, your your precision is going to drop. You're freaking out. So not there's not like, okay, hold my beer, we'll shut down a kind of a uh, shut down a an enemy knight, uh, just as a humble archer, because, you know, they're stupid and we're cooler because we have archers, right? You know, as if they didn't have, the other guy didn't have, again, these are still, they're pretty, the same people, the same Normans. They fight, they fight all in the same way, right? And as far even as the horse archers are concerned, it's more likely there to have been horse archers in France than in, uh, in England by a degree, right? It, but stereotypically, but this also doesn't say anything whether to, you know uh, uh, the, about the existence of of them uh, more or less from one side or another in this specific battle except we have the sources claiming that they were from the loyalist side so we should listen to them and we shouldn't just say oh okay well this wasn't uh, true because at the time I haven't seen it as a frequent thing well that's probably because you have never picked up uh, a book about you know other warfare in other European regions at the time because if you did if you were an actual expert or just a true amateur you'd know that but you sell cheap books on the internet because you think that you are somehow competent because you write about Norman things because it sounds kind of you know macho cool like to talk about the Normans as if you know the rest of Europe didn't have the same things this is kind of weird to me right that's where most of our culture has gotten down to this kind of you know, brutal, cheap, primitive, uh, unrefined, undisciplined 
um, an uncharismatic idea that if you talk about a, a people that evokes some strange emotions in, in the lower masses, uh, this makes you like you know an accomplished person. Uh, this is just a product of a civilizational collapse, especially an educational one. But let's let's skip this 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 aspect. So going on, uh, Otto said, uh, on the plain which is in the field of battle this day, each man's valor and prowess will be distinctly seen. And if we, through our cowardice, suffer the king's baron to be carried off in fetters before our eyes, without striking a blow, how shall we ever venture to appear in the royal presence? We shall justly forfeit both pay and honor, and in my opinion ought no longer to eat the king's bread. A beautiful phrase, by the way, because this is the thing that they cared about. War was made more or less in the same way. The point here was taking action, right? The rebels would have surely showed them, or at least mocked the, the enemy by saying, look, we, we caught uh, Henry's guy, and you're just there uh, doing nothing, and we will simply, uh, you know, come back and pass you by because you don't have the guts to attack us. And so at that point, what would Henry think about these alleged loyalists? That they, they were colluded actually with with the rebels that they were too coward they were too weak this would have caused kind of the the rebels to cause to to actually gain momentum uh, and or to go unopposed so it was of of great importance for these men for their political future for their allegiance to henry um to uh to to give battle and it, especially the last phrase is is, bo is really beautiful. It's, it's very reminiscent of the concept, literally, of masnata. That is to say, seemingly we, we don't know the etymology, but it may have been literally because um, from the the grinded bread that was given to to the as a general food to these retinues or and or like the bucellari, you know, in the Byzantine period. That's the kind of the you know to earn the, your bread loaf practically. Uh, says we, we shall justly forfeit both pay and honor, and in my opinion, ought n no longer to eat the king's bread. Right. So properly, we are just not worth at that point to be considered knights, to be considered noblemen, to be considered anyone that would normally defend the king's cause. That is the higher one, uh, and we will essentially be we will fall, and in 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 many ways. Because these guys had all sworn an oath, by the way, so that there was a sacred bond, and and they knew that coming less to that equated to be doomed as individuals in front of God, in front of a superior principle that could confer them victory. So um, this was just their duty. Also, one of the good chances actually to to show off, to 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 accomplish something, to extend also their own personal power to one of their own retinues. Everything was logical in that regard. It was a good chance to give battle. Here probably Orderic is also dramatizing probably they had of of course they maybe didn't hadn't seen the enemy host before or whatever. Um uh in any case we don't know exactly what kind of calculation they made. Because we just rely on these texts and not much else. In fact uh, an interesting thing is that regarding even even the terminology, uh, Alderic, while talking before about the rebel army, calls it Aches, right? And the reason being, you know, that Aches again is the battle line formed in battle, um, in, in on on the field for battle. I mean, and, and if he uses that as instead the enemy host in movement. So Alderic probably didn't have that kind of idea of. Well, he he by Achilles, he was thinking probably in an unsophisticated Latin, like it's you can't say it's an exercitus because they are not part of a public army of some sort. They're not so probably the rebels didn't have um, more than some or several hundred uh, knights themselves. Uh, the number is not even proper. You call thus Achilles, which is a bit less right it's not a horde it's not there aren't other terms but let's say um the 
the, the numbers not given and the terminology in Latin is relatively imprecise, as we've seen with, with the archer's agmen, right? And uh, interestingly enough, if you click on Wikipedia, um, they, t they give you... <laughs> Look at how people think. It, it's incredible. They say, what was the strength of the enemy uh, of the uh, of the loyalists and, and of the rebels? It says, from the loyalists, 300 knights. 300 men, actually. They write in English here. I don't know how, why, how they do that. Because properly, it's 300 milites in the source. And then 40 knights from the rebel side. If you just read Orderic's account, uh, it's explicitly said that the loyalists had 300 knights at least, plus maybe other men, but the 300 are just the militas. And the 40, as we'll see now, comes for the rebels just for the losses of the of the horses, right? So they count the knights as if they were like, you know, 40 knights, the only thing we know about the, re the other army. No, we know that they were by the same source, more than 300 at least. Because uh, it just told you. And so you make a, a, you know, a stupid Wikipedia article that doesn't even quote um, sources correctly. And that fundamentally decides that to flip the entire meaning of the battle by claiming that you know the, the rebels here were numer dramatically numerically inferior, just like one to eight. So the person that doesn't know where to find the source, which is not listed, by the way, right here, Arderic is not quoted. There are just studies. You see here the, the the disease of scholarship. You have this stupid book on on the internet um, from 2015 that says this amount of BS. This is not an expert. He talks about different articles, different articles from the internet, by the way, not academic ones, um, and, and other stuff collected again so, you know, poorly on, on the internet. It doesn't even give you the, the primary sources, right? This is ridiculous. Um, and um, I, I don't know what's wrong with people, but just to make you understand, this is also, by the way, the, the English Wikipedia so that is, in theory, the, the most, on average, the, the best informed, um, among the various national ones, especially about history and the history of these countries that are technically close, I mean, the Normans, the Anglo-Normans, to their culture, that's the level. Like, imagine a person, again, clicks here and says, ah, it was like, this is the problem, now I will copy the, those numbers. And they, the person doesn't even know that the text doesn't say this at all. And by a, a large margin of error, um, tens of, 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 you know, of times in, in scale different. Do you, do you understand how mistakes are done through these, uh, through these mechanisms, right? Um, and then I go on, it says, All Odo's comrades, encouraged by this exhortation, consented to dismount, provided he did the same. This is an interesting detail, because uh, dismounting was not really... Um, this men were first of all very proud about their equestrian lifestyle was a, a mean of kind of elevation etc of course here the reason why they agree to dismount themselves is that all those uh, all that was the, the commander here that proposed the battle plan would dismount himself so there was not an excuse for him to because that's what's the problem on horseback you can flee right he said if you dismount and you uh, you, you cannot flee um, especially if there are enemy horsemen around. These are militas, by the way, so it's not that they can even run away so easily, right? Uh, there are, from the other side, lighter troops that can just even chase them on foot much more easily, and especially after the battle, in a lost battle, where you're psychophysically broken, right? Um, but you want to show also through that that you're committed to your, to your own plan. I mean, you are commanding these troops, the plan was yours, you took responsibility for it, and thus uh, you have to set the example, right? And so agreeing, going on, says, to which he took his station on foot at the head of the troops. That's also an important position because it spirits them and shows that he's brave and he's confident in what is, uh, in, 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 
confronting the enemy uh, without fear, troops by whom he was much beloved and stood in arms cheerfully waiting for the conflict to begin. The young Valeran, eager to uh, win the honor of knighthood, exulted with boyish delight as soon as the enemy appeared. But Omori, so these are the rebels instead, because they, they, they saw uh, essentially uh, that the enemy, uh, the loyalists were, were few, as we've seen, and they, they had this mount and so on, boyish delight, and as the enemy appeared. But Omori, that was more expert, more mature in age and wisdom, dissuaded his less prudent comrades from engaging rashly. By all the world, such was Omari's oath, I am for declining a battle, for if with our small force we venture to engage our numerous enemies, I much fear we shall suffer loss and disgrace. See, Otto Borlang had dismounted. Be sure that he will obstinately contend for victor, which is interesting because it shows that also the rebels thought not to be numerous enough, right? Um, it says, we, with such few, we, we entered there against many, uh, we, you know, we may lose. Here, actually the same order is somehow ambiguous, because he first said that actually it was the loyalists who met the rebels and said, oh my god, these guys are too many. Right, um, and so they wavered, right? And now it's these guys that say, okay, well, the, the enemy is present in number. And in fact, Omari, that is basically, you see, from one side you have Valorant with the young guy that says, let's attack them, right? And probably there was some confidence there, I don't know, on the fact that maybe he saw that those troops that were visible at least were dismounted. Um, uh, or we don't know whether they probably saw a mounted a reserve. We, we don't know about that, whether they saw it or didn't see it. In any case, Omori answers him is that the enemy had come in numbers, that again, 300 knights is not nothing at the time, right? It's still a consistent force, and Omori adds, see, Aldo Borlang, that he knew, has dismounted. Be sure that he will obstinately contend for victory, because they knew that if somebody dismounted there, it was habitually just also to resist that kind of cavalry charge, and they were as we were saying before, without horses, they couldn't flee, they were fighting to the death. And he compliments him and says, this brave knight, now that he has, uh, he and his comrades have become foot soldiers, will not retreat, but must either conquer or die. So these guys, in other words, yes, they may have, they were surely inferior in numbers, because they had dismounted, otherwise, you know, if you have an advantage, in cavalry, you exploit it in attack. It's typical to dismount when you have that inferiority, right? Um, and it's a way of devoting yourself not to uh, not to break, because if you do, you know that you're going to be chased down and, and either taken prisoner or killed. So this was also to boost the morale in the face of such formidable numbers that also the rebels had, right? For the, at least in relation to one another. And Valoran answers, Omari says, the other, uh, the other replied, have we not long wished to meet the English, the Angli, remember this, on evil ground? Here they are, let us fight, for a shameful flight will bring dishonor on us and our posterity. So in other words, they were thinking from both sides the same thing. <laughs> you know? We have here the flower of the chivalry of France and Normandy, talking about themselves. Who can resist it? Far be it from us to be frightened by a band of peasants and common soldiers that we should turn out of our road to avoid them or have any hesitation in giving them battle. Now, from this speech, you understand this, that um, probably, in fact, the numerical balance was not enormously, uh, uh, say, disproportional. The rebels were more numerous, but they still considered the enemy as having come in numbers as well. Also, the fact that, oh, look at these peasants and common soldiers. We've seen that, according to Odric, uh, the, um, the, the, the loyalists uh, had gathered 300 milites, 
which were not peasants. And gregari, as it's said in the Latin text, so in this case some sort of retinues, right? And this also meant these are not old noblemen, They're, these are not liegemen as they were, remember that, that um, even the speech of Aldo speaks of the fact that these were liegemen, they were connected to Han Henry, and those were evidently people that even Valoran thought they were valiant indirectly, but the rest is mostly peasants and gregarious, so you can argue that perhaps for 300 militias there were at least other, you know, uh, another 300, let's say, maybe commoners of some kind, it's possible. So this battle is actually not just so small as it sounds, and it all makes sense, really. Um, and that we should turn out our road to, um, to avoid them, we would be shamed for, because um, we have instead the best of France and Normandy here. Now, the interesting thing, as I already pointed out, is that they consider... Henry's liegemen brought from from England, and some of them were surely French themselves, um, as the Angli, as Englishmen, practically. The, the source is written <laughs> at his age, right? That same in contemporary times. So this is already eloquent regard, uh, about the, the divide that existed between the two sides, also in a sort of national base, and so two areas that doesn't matter whether it's still the Normans around, and they were definitely the same in that regard, still were perceived as the interest of two different areas. This, this is what Orderic says. Maybe because he, uh, as an Anglo-Norman, was more rooted to, to Britain in some way. It's possible. Right, and that would also be interesting per se. We, we haven't asked the, the guys interested. <laughs> we don't know their voice about that. But it's evident that the same Henry, I mean, this were Norman kings spoke French. They, they weren't quite English uh, as we intend today. Um, so they decide to give battle equally. Right, so I think if you just read this dialogue, you can understand, again, the... I've read also other books about this battle, not just Wikipedia, it's terrible, but it's so confused, like, people don't even take in, in consideration this kind of speech that basically tells you so much, right, in terms of, um, you know, so what the, you know, the, the, the ratios were, the numbers, the perspectives were concerned. This is quite interesting, it's as, almost a psychologistic approach from Orderic, right, in storytelling. And so the thing uh, gets down to uh, a paragraph. Uh, Arderic writes, They, um, so we're talking about the rebels here, therefore range themselves in order of battle. So they deploy. And the interesting thing here is that he uses the term um, ashes. Right? He uh, literally says, Aches ergo suas ordinaverunt. What does this mean? It, that there were multiple aches. I don't know, maybe uh, because it's plural in this case and it's the same um, as singular actually in the Latin declension, but um, the, um, uh, the adjective is plural. And uh, maybe even in this case, Orderic is talking about the aches in general, his, their ranks, their lines, whatever. But more specifically, it would seem that there were multiple battle lines, just like the uh, royalists slash loyalists had. Um, so as we've seen, there were, you know, at least two, right? It's possible from this side there were two as well, right? Um, we don't know about the entire picture. Uh, it's possible, in my opinion, that the rebels had more like three maybe, like we've seen it, for example, again, in the Battle of Poitiers, it's not comparable, but generally speaking, you know, if, as we've seen, probably the rebels in this case had more uh, more numbers, they may have used them to, to create another reserve that was also more than what the, uh, the loyalists had, right? Now, the battle begins, it says, At first Count Valoran wished to charge the enemy with forty men at arms, but his horse was shot by the archers 
and fell under him. Maybe this is what um, we were talking about before in terms of, um, you know, Valoran wanted to attack directly just for with his troops, right? And these commands uh, quarreled, debated, as we've just seen. And so here normally there was um, uh, the, this... Um, kind of immediate attack even from from uh, from Valorant because they sometimes they attacked in echelons the, they they had separate parts of the battle line in which the would operate so the distinction here is not it is important because it tells you also which is the number of troops we're talking about 40 milites says but his horse was shot by the archers and fell under him so the the enemy archers made their job right and during this charge he fell there was a problem because, you know, he was an important leader because of his retinue and so on, so that was important for the cohesion of the same. And says, no less than 40 horses were thus killed in the onset, which, um, it says, and brought to the ground before the riders could strike a stroke. What does this mean? Are the 40 horses the same one of Valorant's? It's unlikely, right? It doesn't say all the horses of, Val of Valorant's unit were taken down. Plus, it says no less than 40. So it says that, in theory, there were maybe even 40 plus 1. So he's not talking about here uh, a first uh, corral, let's say, of, I don't know, 40 men attacking singularly. He's talking about a Nagius that even if it was larger, something like at least 80, as we'll see now, uh, and uh, or more. Right as as we've seen, maybe the, also the from the loyalist side, considering three hundred milites, there were at least two battle lines, so one hundred and fifty for side it could be eighty men. Um, that what that's part of the numbers usually, which this kind of subdivisions went forty, eighty, etc. Um, so it's interesting that it says also not less than 40 horses were thus killed in the onset and brought to the ground before their riders could strike a stroke. What does this mean? Well, it means that even at least considering that there were also repeated charges or this time, that um, this um, the archer fire was continuous and he's not talking just about uh, the first charge, he's talking about a prolonged engagement, in which, of course, this archer is not a magic machine gun that takes down all the horses around. They were clashing against probably the first line of the dismounted knights of the loyalists, and receiving this, I mean, trying to break, uh, and uh, sometimes even not, in fact, smashing into them, but psychologically also testing the enemy, the arrows are insidious, but they're not the most important thing. The most important target objective is the the enemy, the dismounted knights of the enemy. If you can't break those, the archers are done for, right? And so you can't quite attack the archers because you would just, you know, um, they concentrate your force and your order from the main objective that is the, 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 the battle line of dismounted knights, um, which is interesting too because it shows that this f frontal agmen of archers wasn't actually between the horses, I mean, the the enemy battle lines, or it was a front line and the front line, right? They were probably somewhere else. Either they were doing something like back and forth among the ranks, which surely did happen as well, and or they were in, on the wings, as is likely, by the way, as we have seen. Um, then Orderic writes, in consequence, the party of the Count was quickly overpowered and routed, each man abandoning his arms and every encumbrance and seeking his safety in flight in the best manner he could. Count Valoran and the two Hughes, his brother in law, and nearly 80 other men at arms were taken prisoners on the spot, and being closely confined in the king's dungeons, paid the penalty of their rash enterprise in deep distress. What can we derive from this quick um, uh, you know, engagement? Then there are details we will read later, but the concept is that at least 80 prisoners on the spot means that there were surely many more others somewhere, and that these guys didn't just let themselves be taken out by the archers, but it, it 
it's a good reason why they, they would have been taken prisoners like that. We also should highlight the fact that here there is no counterattack described. We don't know what the uh, dismounted knight's line actually did besides receiving the enemy. We don't know what the reserve operated like. We don't know how and when exactly the the enemy decided to be routed. Here, it's as if you read it, it's as if the archers had won the battle. <laughs> Except we know it doesn't work like this. Um, by definition, by many standards that I already discussed before. Um, and also considering the average loss rate, um, actually medieval battles, contra contrarily to popular opinion, were quite bloody. right? And I think this is a good example of it, even though it says later that uh, basically nobody died. But that, as we'll see, also has to do with kind of the knightly recognition of some, you know, who did die, right? Do you think that the name, you know, the numbers of the peasants here would have been counted? Um, the point is that if we give a 20% losses, which is fair for this kind of battles, we could increase it and so decrease the total of the enemy. But we could think that for 80, uh, 80 uh, um, knights, knights, captured, by the way, because it literally says um, uh, the um, nearly 80 other men at arms of Militas, right, so were taken. So here we're talking about the, the cream, but it doesn't say, you know, the, what about the others, what about the peasants, how many, and were they captured, were just killed because they were not worth ransom, and would, would it be written, would it be suitable for, even to say for for somebody like an author that is actually against these rebels, as we've seen, the enemy leader is depicted like a, a boar that kill, that chops the pieces of peasants. What, what do we know? It, it's unlikely from Orderic to say that also, you know, that the loyalists would take in peasants from, that were from the enemy's side and, and chop them to pieces, right? There you can see the bias that sometimes we can see. So we're talking about, at least if we talk about in terms of milites, let's say 1 to, let's say, 20% captured, we have easily um, 400, right? Um, and we, we're we not even sure, maybe they were uh, doubled that. Maybe they were less, but, you know, if... Mm, I don't know here, maybe Ordric, uh, whether he knew how many the enemies were, or he didn't want to say that, but he at least makes clear that they were more numerous than the loyalists. So we don't know. But for 80 men-at-arms captured, surely there were lots of others that were not there. Um, at this point, it's likely even that maybe the loyalists were something like, uh, I don't know, I don't want to give numbers, but it could be easily in the, in the number of thousands altogether. The same goes for the enemy. Right, so, and so what here, it's, it's actually a bigger engagement than it seems when you read, oh, it's just 300 knights. No, there weren't 300 knights. There were 300 knights, maybe there were 2,000 peasants, uh, commoners, or other troops of some kind. How do you count the milites specifically? This is not so easy as it seems, right? There was an important engagement, and evidently one that was um, carried out also with some important degree of attrition. Here, there is no information about the length of the battle. There is no information about the terrain. Yes, we can think that from the forest of Breton there was uh, this reserve that attacked from the flank by surprise and that the enemy collapsed. Maybe here uh, uh, Orderic doesn't want to say that because maybe it was considered as unchivalric. It's likely. It's possible. It's possible. Um, and and more. right? We don't know exactly here the, the, the rebel Aches, how they were deployed or whatever. This is a crucial aspect, because without this knowledge, we, we cannot understand basically what happened in the battle. The map I inserted here, however, could be a good simplified example. Of course, also from a graphical point of view, it's rather poor. Like, it's okay, right? I would say I would do probably a similar uh, sketch myself. Um, but it kind of gives the idea of how... You know, it was possible. This thing of the archers, again, it's likely that the Norman rebels had even more archers than the enemy. <laughs> you know, we don't know this, right? It doesn't sound like that, does it, right? But um, it's likely it was there. There is no reason why uh, this 
uh, Anglo-Norman force should have not should have had more archers than a uh, a Norman force. Uh, literally, uh, statistically, it it's not a thing. Archers were everywhere. Uh, there were surely uh, archers, crossbowmen, longbowmen from both sides in this battle. I can bet on it. I mean, there wouldn't be anything strange about it, considering numbers as well. There's some slight extra info here. Uh, it says William de Grandcourt, the son of William Count de, a gallant soldier in the Royal Army, uh, was present in this battle and took Amaury prisoner as he was making his escape. So also the commander was captured, which means it was probably a hard-fought battle, right? Because all the, the, the like. Here, we were not told whether Omari was in the first line or the second, whatever. As we've seen, Aldo had been stationed in the, fir in the front line there because he mostly had to, to, to set this example. But it's possible, as we've seen also with Valor and etc., that there was a different order in the rebel arm. Um, as he was making his... Uh, Omari was, was fleeing, by the way. So w what is interesting at this point is that 80... Militas uh, were captured on the spot. Um, Ordric says, if Omari was caught while he was making his escape, it means that there were other people like him, presumably, that were taken. Uh, and, uh, and so this makes also probably the number of the rebels to increase significantly. Because let's say that a double were taken during the pursuit. At that point, you, you understand that in proportion the size of the rebel army is likely to increase dramatically. Uh, so all in all, when Omori said, look, if you give battle and we are not even so few there, it means probably that there weren't so few to have a, an overwhelming numerical superiority on the enemy. And if, say, the enemy had 1,000 men and the uh, and the rebels had 1500 right at that point well uh, like it's obvious like it's a pretty evenly balanced thing or if, you, if, if you're attacking a defensive position even if you, are, you have a 2 to 1 you're not fully sure you're gonna make it right and as the same already had pointed out Odo had was there to stand his ground or die together with, with all his men that had agreed to do that so uh, it, it, it's an important uh, moral and tactical concept here. And uh, the the episode of Marie uh, goes on because it's, um, this um, William de Grandcourt that um, captures Marie while he was f fleeing says, was touched for a man of such bravery, knowing to a certainty that if he made him his captive, he would never with great difficulty get out of the king's hands. He resolved to abandon his sovereign and his own possessions and go into exile rather than entangle a count of such distinguished wart in the meshes of a net from which he could never extricate himself. This is one of the most beautiful passages here, because it literally says that this guy had captured Omori. And you see, once the guy was captured, traditionally it was his own tradition was that the conqueror uh, has the right to do whatever uh, with his prisoner, but this prisoner was so distinguished that this good knight, the son of the Count of U, could not bear the responsibility of capturing such a distinguished individual like uh, Omori III of, of Montfort. Right? Uh, and thus, uh, he lets him free uh, and he uh, decides to exile, him, exile himself beautiful and says thus uh, he therefore conducted uh, him as far as Belmont and then becoming an exile with him as his preserver found an honorable refuge in France right which is interesting so literally this guy was uh, a loyalist, he was convinced of his cause, but he, in order not to compromise himself for having ca captured such a great lord, uh, decides to essentially pass to the other side and he has a future uh, you know, from you know, the, the anti, uh, 
from, from the rebel side, let's say, also the one backed by the Capetians against Henry. Right? Just think about how these men lived and by which standards and which, with which ideas um, I, of chivalry and nobility and so on. And then there is William Louvel being taken prisoner by a peasant from whom he ransomed himself by giving, giving him his armor had his hair cropped by him so that he may pass for a groom, and taking a staff in his hand, he got away to the river Seine. Arriving in this disguise at the ferry, he gave his boots to the boatman for carrying him over and reached home on his bare feet, uh, only too happy to have escaped any how from the enemy's hands. Right, this is also quite... Uh, quite a thing. Then there are other episodes, right, about the fate um, of these prisoners, but it's something that eludes the the tactical dimension. There maybe some some insight. It's mostly about the punishment against these people. So this is it, right? And you understand why this battle is. You would say, but it's disappointing. Well, it's not disappointing, because it actually teaches you more than what normally you can find uh, on the internet, in this case, if you actually read the story. And the aspect is, uh, the, the most important one is especially about this balance between the forces, right? And um, there is um, um there is naturally a, you know, a, a, an important level of uncertainty, as you noticed. But overall, what we get from this battle is that uh, the the stand, especially the role of the archers, was seen as particularly important. Mm -hmm. But there surely something else happened. That the reference to the horse archers, the the presence of reserves, can tell us. Um, actually a much more detailed picture. We don't know. Again, most of the stuff you find out that were just these... We know of these 40 knights of the first of Valor and then uh, other numbers that are similar. And, and then what? What does it tell us? That, does it tell us how the battle lines interacted? How many were there? What did they do? What they didn't? This is kind of typical. Sometimes if you read 13th century battles, 14th century battles, first of all, they knew they used battle lines in depth in different ways, different combinations depending in the 12th century sometimes they use just also broader fronts not necessarily in depth formation but in this case um, as we've seen the at least the Anglo-Normans did that because they had to slow down the enemy onslaught. They simply succeeded right what it seems here to have happened by a degree is that um, the, the battle line resisted right we don't know of losses of significant kind of Aldo or anything, so the idea is that the mounted reserve that we um, we um, we have placed like just in the rear perhaps was actually located on the flank, right? Maybe to attack one of the battle lines of the enemy. Here again, the fact that a chivalric mentality would um, hide this procedure is is highly likely. But you see, as in other medieval sources, always the reference to a reserve, a mounted one, that appears in the speech, it's clear, it's there, and uh, you could have guessed what it could have done. Right? So if the, the, the dismounted knights were not broken, this mounted reserve surely intervened in some other way. Maybe they, out, they outflanked the enemy, the forest of Breton maybe provided with some sort of... Um, uh, so, sort of, uh, you know paths that could bring on the on the flank of the enemy without being spotted by him um, that's a good take right uh, if especially if you want to reason in minimalistic terms which is probably correct in a kind of Occamian way you can appreciate uh, maybe a, a double battle line right with Valoran uh, there uh, but there were also other troops likely as we've seen there weren't just 40 of his man, and then another battle line led by Omori, which is likely, right uh, here in the picture again. We have placed them side to side, but it's not necessarily gone like that. We don't know, as a matter of fact, how it it did, right? It, it rather seems like perhaps with the first attack by Valorant was fenced off successfully, just 
battle line versus battle line. The, as we've seen, the horses were bogged down by the by the archery wings. Um, then uh, Omari said, "Okay, but this mounted uh, this, this mounted knights are exhausted. Now I can break them anyway, because also probably the archers, with all the shooting, lost their arrows or something. Maybe they had time between one enemy battle line and another to to collect some of them." And it's likely that at that point, um, uh, the uh, the battle line of Odo still had enough forces to resist for a while Omori's charge. And at that point, the mounted reserve of the Anglo-Normans attacked Omori from the side and crushed him. And that's how he got captured while he was fleeing, though. Right? So he had some time to flee. So we don't know what happened. We don't know. Maybe there were three battle lines. Maybe Omori was captured at some point. Uh, while he had decided to break, while maybe the second battle line had been crushed out of tree, and also after the first one of Valoran had been spent, it's all possible, right? It could be it would be interesting to know the terrain. It would be I wouldn't be surprised if the Anglo Normans used some important you know defensive position. That's also maybe what Omari really meant by saying you know we are too few, even though the, the, sor the same source makes clear that they, they had a, an important numerical majority. They made much more of an impression on the, on the enemy than the other way around. Um, so it, it, it has all the air of a typically compact, logical, coherent, and importantly articulated um, uh, battle of this early... Uh, 12, uh, say first half of the 12th century um, that worked in pretty similar uh, ways to the ones we described right? we cannot have the certainty because literally we do not know uh, Orderic is the best source like I don't think we have anything else in terms of tactical evidence that can um, essentially out uh, uh, shine Orderic's uh, sources also because of all these studies that they checked basically didn't um, didn't say anything else. The fact that would be a very few losses among the uh, milites uh, is not surprising. It was asked also recently by um, uh, a follower uh, how I don't remember whether the Battle of Bramul or others here were. Uh, you know, stating this kind of very low losses among the knights, whether it's, it's a realistic thing or how do we have to handle that? Well, I would say the easy answer to this is, yeah, I mean, there was, in my opinion, always kind of a higher kind of uh, amount of losses, especially uh, who are the dead here, the ones on the battlefield, the ones also that died of uh, wounds later, because very often that is not accounted like like in this case, um, and it was actually frequent. And also, is it just the knights? And also, how badly uh, were they kind of captured? Like you know, were were they wounded? Were they? We don't know, right? Maybe this exactly because of a sense of courtesy. Say, you know, even killing someone was considered negative enough, so that the same historiography wouldn't um, wouldn't actually um, say say, okay, we killed so many knights, you know, unless there was a specific reason, right? These these guys here are represented a bit like the villains, um, but uh, the um, uh, the, 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 there is also respect, as we've seen with Montfort, that uh, the the loyalist decides to to defect for, because he couldn't uh, keep prisoner. He was too much of an important guy uh, that would have ruined uh, the reputation of the capturer. Right, so it's it's likely uh, there is likely a lot that we should see a bit more in context there. Um, a thing I would say about the flank attack last is that this, would, if it was carried out, right, it was probably carried out by, however, a shock force of some kind. So that's why, actually, I'm modifying right now the picture that you have seen I uploaded here, um, the way I, I modified it now <laughs> um, throughout the whole video, uh, with the idea that the mounted reserve. Uh, may have carried out during the battle kind of a flank attack of some sort 
This is purely speculative, and I say this because sometimes, let's say, flank attacks do not have to be carried out by entire battle lines. Even a few troops are like 40 are, are okay, right? In fact, there is in Armies of Feudal Europe it says there were 40 of these men that carried out a flank attack and the enemy uh, eventually collapsed. Um, but the, um, and it's still speculative by a degree. However, um, the, uh, the, the still, uh, you need heavy troops, right? So not before I said horse archers just per se, not, not necessarily, right? They, they may have been, um, something more, uh, somehow more sophisticated, uh, and, uh, also for spotting the, the right moment to act and all these kind of things, right? So not as simple as that, uh, like light troops or whatever, right? Just a shock force capable of cutting the enemy line, attacking it from the flank or from the rear at the same time. Um, so I think this is it. I think we can go with this kind of... Uh, it's still always an approximation, there is no doubt, but I think it's it's a fair one. We can say, well, okay, this, this does make sense. It's likely that also the terrain suited this tactics by an important degree um, and uh, we are let's say uh, mm, reasoning through uh, again mostly speculation because we don't have other other knowledge of this all for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. For now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.